Today's webinar will begin with Jackie Fletcher. Jackie was awarded her OBE for her services to wound care management. Jackie is currently the clinical lead for pressure ulcer work stream of the National Wound Care Strategy Program. A leading authority on pressure ulcers, an independent wound care consultant and editor of Wounds UK Journal. Jackie will be setting the scene of why the development of the best practice statement for dark skin tones is so important in the UK. An overview of the importance of awareness and education of dark skin tones and how the best practice statement came to be created. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, and it's a great pleasure to talk to you about this best practice statement, which was developed by Wounds UK. I'm speaking today in my independent consultant role. This is not a, a piece of the work from the National Wound Care Strategy. So this is the document that I want to talk to you about, the best practice statement addressing skin tone bias in wound care, assessing signs and symptoms in people with dark skin tones. And this document was very kindly sponsored by 3M and ST, and as you can see, was put together by an expert working group chaired by myself and Lakshmi. Uh, and there was a group of clinicians, including uh, Nisha and a variety of others involved in this work. And it's important to explain where the document came from. For me, with my background in pressure ulcers, I initially was challenged around 2017, 2018 about the use of the Reactor Red programme and whether this was equitable and whether it encouraged good assessment of skin in different skin tones. And it really made me think and start to challenge what we were doing. And it seemed at the time that this was something quite new. This hadn't been brought to my attention before. But actually, when I started to think about it and I looked back through some of my uh, papers that I'd got, some of the work that I'd done previously, I noticed that actually this isn't a new thing. And you'll notice that in, in some of these older documents, some of the language isn't what we'd say now. But as far back as you can see here in 1988, Spectrum team noticed that non-whites and you know, we'll go on to talk about this language not being appropriate anymore, were being seen to have more pressure ulcers. And it wasn't just that one paper. You can see here a variety of papers, 2009, 2010, were really focusing on this disparity in patient skin tone and were patients developing a patient harm because their skin wasn't being appropriately assessed and those early signs of skin damage weren't being picked up. But it also made me challenge, was this just about pressure ulcers? And the more I thought about assessing different skin colours, the more it, it came to me that we shouldn't just be focusing on pressure ulcers because we assess skin for a whole variety of reasons and pressure ulcers is only one of those problems. And it made me think about, was redness the right word? What does redness mean? What does it indicate from a physiological perspective? And we use redness as an obvious sign of erythema, erythema being a physiological response. So whether we're talking about pressure ulcers, venous leg ulcers, diabetic ulcers, or a whole host of other things, what we are using the word red to describe is the inflammatory response and what seems an obvious indicator of that. And what that erythema, because it's erythema, that's the underlying process, relates to a whole range of things, not just pressure ulcers. So we use erythema to indicate that the patient may have a common skin disease, such as eczema or psoriasis, or they might have a scar. We use erythema to indicate temperature change. So whether you're hot or cold, you may find your hands or your face go uh, show this side of erythema. Some of us get that nice flush if you have alcohol. I know if I drink, I get a very red area around my neck. We also have erythema if you have gravity. So if you choose to stand on your head or you're pooling patients who keep their, their lower limbs down in like venous disease, it might be dermatitis due to allergy or trauma, a bite or a sting. I'm guessing many of you have had that erythematous response uh, in relation to your recent COVID immunizations. It can be a change in blood flow. So we often see patients with a really engorged sacral area. It can be a response to some treatment like radiotherapy or to sunburn. It can be used as a descriptor in infection. So I'm sure you're all very uh, familiar with heat, redness, pain and swelling uh, as those descriptors of, of infection. And it can be any other form of inflammation that I've not necessarily covered here. But why the erythema is important is it's a flag to us. It tells us that we need to do something about it, whether that's to measure it or to treat it. 
And the most common way we measure erythema is, is visually. We look at it, we see it. And if it is redness, then we will do this blanch test. We'll press it to see if it goes white. And that's not just about pressure ulcers. We might be thinking about something like meningitis, where we take a clear glass and we roll it over the rash. We may take the temperature of the person. So if somebody says they're flushed, if they're hot, or we might check the temperature of the skin. And I guess many of you, whether it's your child or a family member, the first thing you do when somebody says they feel unwell is you put your hand to their head and check their temperature. We will often with things like cellulitis, draw around it to see if it spreads or measure it as an indicator. So if you're looking for a definition of what is a wound infection, we'll describe erythema that is more than two centimetres from the wound. We can use colour scales or colour intensity scales like the Munsell scale or disease specific scales like the Howard Robinson scale, the Fitzpatrick scale or the Vancouver scar scale. We may photograph it. We may use other things like ultrasound, SEM or thermography to try and identify it a little more clearly. But the challenge when you are using, using the visual assessment on dark skin is if we don't see it, then we don't respond to it. So that measurement and that treatment don't start to, answer, to happen. So if you look at the two images here, so the image on the, the left of the screen, this is my leg, and I use this to describe this erythema in teaching a lot. This is a very straightforward example of I had been sat on a train, I'd had my legs crossed, I uncrossed my legs, and I had that lovely red circle where my legs had been pressed together. What you see on the right is a colleague who has dark skin compared to me, and they had done exactly the same. They did this for me. This was an experiment to see what it looked like. And you can see if I did not put that yellow circle around the area on their leg, you would find that very difficult to see. So although there is the same erythema, there's the same um, physiological response, what you see visually is not the same at all. And I mentioned how important language is. And when we're talking about skin tone, it's important to know that ethnicity is not the same as skin colour. So we shouldn't be describing people by their ethnic origin to think about what we see in terms of their skin colour, because we have people of, of the same ethnicity with a huge gradient of skin colour. We shouldn't be using a comparison to white. So in that first old paper that I, I showed you, it said non-white skin tones, because that's an implication that white is the norm and it isn't necessarily so. But we also need to remember there might be cultural significance associated with the description. When we were putting the uh, best practice statement together, one of the things that was really apparent in the group was that language was seen to be really sensitive and that and people really struggled to engage in an open way because they weren't sure what was the right word or the correct word or the right descriptors and they were really worried about offending people or saying the wrong word and we tried to really help with the document to get over that so there are lots of ways of describing the different skin tones and if you go to the literature the most common ones you'll see is the munsell skin skin colors this tends to be used a lot in the States and it's used in things like the uh, pressure skin healing tool, the push tool. If you look in the dermatology literature, you'll see the Fitzpatrick scale and the Fitzpatrick scale types one through to six describes the skin's response to radiation. So this is about does the skin tan easily? How well does that happen? But neither of these felt appropriate for what we were looking for in assessing skin generically. So I started to look around for other, other skin tone assessment tools and I found a Pantone chart. You may be familiar with Pantone from paint. Some of you might have mugs or little pictures with them on. And this had so many different skin colours. It didn't feel practical for a clinical assessment tool. There were too many skin tones to use. What I did find that seemed much better was this Ho and Robinson skin tone bar chart. And you can see that across the six bars, there are different colours. So you have gradation of skin tones. And what was really important is that this had been tested for reliability and validity with real patients and with real clinicians. So they'd ask the patients to describe where they felt their skin matched against these bars. They'd ask clinicians to describe where it matched. And it'd been validated by a group of dermatologists. So it's given us a much tighter group of colours to work with. And patients and clinicians felt it was appropriate to the skin colour that they would describe. 
In terms of language being important, it's not just in tissue viability we're seeing this. So you can see there's a reference here to uh, uh, a resource from the British Association of Dermatology. And some of the work we've included in the best practice statement reflects some of this terminology that you've seen here. And they very much go down the line that I started from, that erythema is a change in colour of an area of skin and it's about increased blood flow in the capillaries and it relates to inflammation. But what they flag exactly as we are doing is that while redness is in a so obvious symptom in patients with less deeply pigmented skin, once the skin tones become darker, that is not so. And so we need to think very clearly about the descriptors that we use. Now, the other thing that, that became apparent when I started to talk to colleagues about this was they reflected on their own experience. And I started to think, does that reflect how I think about skin tone and how my clinical language is developed? And I just wanted to share with you these three little um, ethnicity graphs with you. So the top one uh, is about where I grew up. I'm from Oldham. And you can see the population of Oldham was 77% white. We had quite a high Asian population. Now remember I said that ethnicity doesn't necessarily reflect a skin tone, but I does, do think it affects your, your, the way you discuss these things. When I became a nurse, I trained in London and my first placement was in Hackney. Now you can see in this middle graph and less than 50% of the local population was white. But where I live now and where I've lived for the last 25 years is in a rural village in Bedfordshire. And 97% of my local population are white. And you might say, well, you know, what's the relevance of that? The relevance is when I speak to TVNs, some of them will say to me, well, our local population is 97, 98% white. This is really not relevant to us. We don't see many patients at all with dark skin tones. And my challenge back to them was, actually, you are exactly the people that this document is aimed at. Because when I worked in Hackney, I saw lots of people with lots of different skin tones. And actually, I became much more skilled and much more experienced at looking at their skin and knowing what I was looking for and using skills other than touch. Whereas if you work in an area that is predominantly white, actually you have less experience of looking at different skin colours and knowing what to do. So regardless of your local patient demographics, clinicians must have a knowledge and awareness to provide optimal care for all. So within the best practice statement, we try to focus on really pragmatic approaches that the senses, especially touch, should be considered as part of inspection and assessment. It shouldn't just be about visual. We should listen to the patient's perspective, both to aid accurate assessment and understand their choices, needs and preferences. And remember that skin tone is separate to ethnicity, but importantly, have the confidence to talk about this in a professional way, treating the patient as an individual. So you can see within the document, we've tried to make sure that we don't just focus on pressure ulcers because it isn't just about pressure ulcers. What we've suggested is that when you assess the skin, you compare to a similar anatomical location. So if a patient has a heel pressure ulcer, look at the contralateral heel to see what it's like. And remember, particularly in patients with dark skin tones, the, um, the sole of the foot, or if it's on hand, the palm of the hand may be a much lighter skin colour. You can just about see that on the heel here, where you've got the very dark skin going up the leg, but the foot, uh, the sole of the foot is much lighter. You can see in these lower limb wounds that although you're not seeing erythema, what you are seeing are very distinct changes in colour. And remember that if you're photographing a wound, a calibrated colour indicator should be used where possible, and that we use photographs for recording and monitoring rather than diagnostic uh, purposes. And assessing the legs for all uh, colour changes, we should be looking at texture and all other elements of the change as well. So within the document, we have tried to give some basics around the different wound etiologies. So you can see we've got pressure ulcers, leg ulcers, diabetic foot ulcers, but also skin tears, moisture salted skin damage and medical adhesive related skin damage. And try to pick up on the really key things that you might be assessing, not just focusing on the patient's skin colour and some tips to help you to really do a good assessment. So what particular things you might want to be looking out for. So in diabetic foot ulcers, for example, looking out for potential infection. We know that's a problem in patients with all skin tones with diabetes because their inflammatory response isn't always good. But remembering that we must use our sense of touch 
feeling for temperature changes and also texture changes. So if you're looking for inflammation, that might be heat you're feeling for. It might be hardness related to that inflammatory response or the kind of edema that goes on around that. So really, for me, the most important message from the, the skin tones document is that in all wound types and skin conditions, it's important to be aware of how signs and symptoms may present in a range of skin tones. But I think fundamentally what the document is saying is that skin assessment is more than about what we see. Whichever patient that you are assessing, we should be using all our senses. So as well as looking at what we can see, we should be touching, we should be speaking to the patient and we should be listening to what the patient says. So hopefully that's given you an introduction to the document and where the document came from and a little bit of the content. So it's thank you from me. I will wait for questions at the end and I'm happy now to hand over to Nisha. Thank you.